So I would like to give a uh, very casual um, kind of explanation of my work, previous ones. So uh, my area uh, previously was in this called uh, origami engineering. So it can be used for two things. One thing is to make structures, origami type, right? Another is to make origami type mechanisms. So for structures, uh, we mainly borrow the geometry from origami and use it uh, on these thin wall structures to kind of modify the shape of it. And correspondingly, the mechanical properties are changed. And um, maybe we change it for uh, energy absorption or some other performances. Maybe sometimes we characterize them as metamaterials. So the reason we are interested in to origami shapes because uh, it's folded from a flat sheet. So if we use the same geometry for our structures, then which means that structure can be manufactured from a uh, sheet materials, maybe a sheet metal. You can stamp it into uh, our origami structures. So that's one type of job. Another uh, type of application is for mechanisms. Uh, here we can see uh, it's a folding up of a space solar panel, right? It's using some sort of origami pattern. That's another application. So um, my PhD work was uh, in this area to make thin wall structures for energy absorption. And uh, in my postdoc, I did uh, the work in the second area to basically uh, make uh, mechanisms or structures, if you will, uh, that can actively uh, deploy or reshape. That's what I did uh, in postdoc. So in this shorter video, I'm gonna talk about uh, the first one, what I did in my PhD. So the topic uh, is called origami structures for energy absorption. And this is my previous supervisor. So uh, in, in the talk, I'll, I'll firstly give an introduction of energy absorption, and then I'll present my solutions for better energy absorbing structures. And now I'll give the conclusion. So the method I use is geometric modifications. So all I did was to change the geometry of the structures and uh, nothing else, nothing of materials or nothing fancy, just the geometry. Uh, sounds very simple, but, but it can actually bring a uh, huge improvement. So let me just uh, show you how I did that. Introduction of uh, energy absorption. So it's an important issue uh, for each day that many people died due to road accident, right? This is just in US, uh, in one day. And so uh, because of these car crashes and so on, uh, if we have good, um, uh, how do you say, energy absorption during the crash, which means the kinetic energy of the vehicle can be uh, absorbed by the structure. And then people will be safer, right? So uh, we need this concept, energy absorption. So to think about it more, okay, let me illustrate it in this way. So if we have a car that is uh, crashing uh, towards a wall, right, it's deforming like that. Correspondingly, if we are recording the reaction force on the wall and uh, versus this displacement, so we'll have this sort of plot, right? And the area underneath it is the energy it absorbs. So for, for this, uh, we normally want uh, this curve to be not too high, uh, the peak force not too high, because if it's very, because, uh, okay, let me think about, okay, if it's too high, uh, which means it, it, it creates a huge deceleration for the passengers inside, right? That's not good, right? You can get, uh, even though the how do you say, the vehicle compartment, the passenger compartment is not destroyed, but people can get injured because of the huge inertia, huge like deceleration, right? They can get uh, internal damage, right? That's one. Second, we don't want this point to be too high because, because this is uh, reflecting the, uh, how do you say, the deformation of the uh, chromosome, right? The crush, the, the, the crush of the area uh, in the front. So if this front area has a huge strength, which means this point is very high, so when you crash, 
it might not necessarily be that this area deforms first, right? It can be this area, right? The compartment area, the passenger's area deforms the first. So in order to let this part deform first, always you need to uh, make this area even stronger than this area. So, so, so if this point is too high, it makes the whole design process very difficult. So, but, but on the other hand, we want, this air, want to maximize this area. So the ideal case is we have a curve that goes up and then switch to flat, to be flat. So it has a maximum area, which means the energy absorption, but the lowest peak force, right? This is what we call it peak force. So we want it to go up and then flat. That's the ideal shape. Okay, this is our target. Okay. So what, what are we using to achieve that target, which are uh, these components, structures, right? There are some components uh, which are in compression, some ones are in bending, like um, uh, this is tubes, crush cans in compression, bending, beams, uh, panels, you can see, right? So my work is to design those components, uh, to look at them one by one and then to think about, okay, how can we improve it to achieve that type of reaction uh, relationship, right? Goes up and then flat, right? That's our target. Energy absorption, let's think about tubes, okay? So there are many three types of uh, mechanism, uh, or, or let's say, uh, ways to absorb energy by tubes. One is called the progressive buckling. This, you can see, when you compress it, it's doing this sort of buckling, local buckling. Another is called uh, material splitting. Another is uh, inversion. Right? So let, let's look at the first one, buckling. So here is a normal square tube. And we have it, this is the cross section. We compress it. This is the simulation. This is the actual experiment I did. So you can see uh, it just falls down. It's typical. And uh, but if you study it and look at the source of energy absorption uh, you can re you will realize that the corners right these four corners actually absorbed uh, two-thirds of the total energy so what can we learn from here is uh, that the energy the source of energy absorption actually concentrates on these corners right but the areas these uh, materials in between right which are these flat panels actually not helping that much so the idea is okay what if we can uh, increase uh, the number of corners right the number of these corners then the energy absorption will increase right the area underneath that curve will increase so this has been proposed by others before right this is not my uh, kind of my contribution so uh, one way to um, increase it is in this way right then you achieve a circular tube, which improved energy absorption by 50%. Good. But that's the limit, right? You cannot have more. So there's another way of increasing. Uh, now, now starts to like be my kind of contribution. So, so if you increase it in this way, you don't actually have a limitation, right? You can keep going. But if you look at this tube, uh, theoretically, well, there's a theory, and uh, it actually achieves 200% more energy absorption than this square tube. So what if we use this one? Of course, it doesn't work. The research always just doesn't work at first. So this is uh, this tube, the cross section, when you compress it, actually it's not stable. You compress it, it will kind of sway sideways and like fall uh, in this manner. Here's another one uh, with more this kind of corrugations. It goes like that, right? So actually the energy absorption is very bad. It's not stable. It's not having that progressive buckling. Uh, and which, uh, so if it only follows that progressive buckling, uh, that energy will be like 200% more, right? If it's doing this kind of uh, one, how do you say, like uh, just folding like that, just basically one fold, then the energy absorption is very low and then the peak force is very high. So it's basically, okay, in a word, it's not what we want. So what can we do to solve that? Okay, and 
Here I propose this, uh, uh, what I call origami concave tube. So what I did is, okay, I want a progressive buckling for this type of tube. So what I did is to introduce a one layer of foldings uh, at the one end. So if this, this is making sense, right? It's just folding, basically creating a layer of imperfection. So now, if you look at how it works, when we have to put the tube in the intro machine, right? When you start to compress it, this layer will be the weakest layer, right? So this layer will deform first, and all the other layers will, they are straight and very steep. So if you compress it, you can see how this layer deforms. And while it deforms, it actually pre-bend or pre-folds the layer uh, that is adjacent to it, right? That, uh, that is above it. So you can see this layer is softened. So when you keep compressing, this layer will deform, and it will soften or pre-fold uh, the other layer that is just above it. But the rest part of the tube is stiff. So this nice um, how to say, behavior actually uh, brings in this dominance effect, right? It brings in an order of kind of uh, folding or deformation, right? It's always one layer by another. And that's the uh, beautiful part of it, is just by doing this, it, it has a very nice deformation. So uh, if you look at the reaction force, uh, this is the normal square tube, which is widely used in our uh, energy absorbing components, in our vehicles, the crush can, a lot of them are similar to this, to this square tube. And then you can see uh, the tube we pre presented or we proposed has actually 3.3 times of the energy absorption. You can see it's way higher. So if you look at this red line, it's kind of what we want. Right? It's going up and then it's sort of going straight all the way to the end. Right? Instead of like this uh, blue one, the square one, it goes up to a very high, has a peak force and then drops down and to be very low. So yeah, so it's a good improvement. So and also this concept can be developed into like other uh, kind of with other bases, uh, tapered shapes or with other this sort of different what we call it, concave shapes. Right. You can see this is another tube, uh, another concave shape with this uh, origami, we can also call it initiator. Right. You crush it, it also feels like this. So this gives you very nice energy absorption. So, um, okay, short summary, uh, the modification of geometries, just introduce one layer of origami folds. Okay, I just want to add, if you introduce uh, multiple layers into that sort of concave tubes, of this imperfection or origami fault, it will actually not work because, uh, as I explained, the beauty is that dominance effect, right? Uh, fair one layer is uh, deforming and is triggering the adjacent layer. So, it's, so at any given moment, there's only one layer that is uh, that is the weakest, softest. But if you add multiple layers of origami faults. Then when you compress it, at one moment, the multiple layers are, are kind of uh, soft. They, are, they, they kind of all deform at once. That will create some uh, instability in the tube, and then it will fail in a global way again. So in order, in, in order for you to have these nice folds locally and staggering uh, one layer by another, so you need to do this modification by only one layer. So that's an interesting combination. So it's a very small um, how do you say, modification. Actually brings you a lot of difference, right? 3.3 times energy absorption. So it's an interesting research. And also uh, we can also argue and um, sort of prove that this design can reach the theoretical limit of energy absorption. So the corresponding reference is this one. And that's one of one, one part of my uh, PhD work. So another part is I look at uh, tube inversion. Oh, I said, what, what, what about this one? Okay, tube inversion. Okay, inversion, let's look at circular tubes, which is standard. 
So if you have a circular tube, uh, you push it against a die, right? This is, there's a rigid die below it. You push it, and the tube will uh, get uh, how to say inverted, and then goes up, right? It has a very large string all the places, and correspondingly, it brings in ultra high energy absorption. But the, okay, the drawback is it's very difficult to occur. So normally, what it happens is that it buckles. The the tube is not strong enough to push this material through this die. Because when you go through it, the material will get circumferentially stretched and then bend it in like in this kind of inversion and then goes up, goes up. And also there's a huge friction between the surface. So normally what people do is introduce a very good lubrication to reduce the friction so that like very carefully you can have an inversion, but it's not reliable in any way. And here are some simulations, uh, which sees if uh, we yeah we can we, we can do it uh, to invert it uh, well when the friction is not too large and also uh, the tubes are perfect so if if our tubes are not perfect which is well the reality right and we add a little bit of imperfection in it and then once we try to invert it it won't work so the problem okay so this type of thing is always uh, key to think about okay why i mean what is the problem and how we can improve it right here the problem is uh the buckling force of the tube is not enough right if so it buckles instead of stay uh, undeformed and also uh the inverting force is too large so that it surpasses the buckling force right? that's and also another thing is uh the tube is very sensitive to imperfection Right, once you introduce the imperfection, the buckling force drops dramatically. So naturally, when we see the problems, we see the solutions. The solutions is that we need to have a tube that has higher buckling force and lower inverting force, and also less sensitive to imperfection. So uh, the solution is corrugated tube. Okay, so that, that has been presented in previous work. Uh, people mention that uh, corrugated tube has less, uh, how to say, sensitivity to imperfection. Right? That's what they said. But no one used this for inversion. Actually, it's a perfect, uh, how to say, candidate for inversion. So here is the corrugated tube. It's very simple design. This is the rigid die. Okay, so uh, that's the previous work. Previous work uh, by these two uh, people. Uh, they claim that this type of uh, corrugated tube has uh, high buckling force and low sensitivity to imperfection. And also, additionally, uh, it has a low stiffness to circumferential stretch. Because if you remember, I mentioned uh, in this inver inversion, you need to uh, stretch your material or the tube circumferentially uh, because, of, because of the shape of the die, right? You need to stretch it and then invert it, right, goes up. So that stretch uh, for this type of corrugated tube is less because it's kind of corrugated, right? You expand it circumferentially, the string actually is it's not through the stretch of the material, it's through the unfolding of the material. For thin wood structures, that costs much less energy. So that's the, here's the idea. So here's the uh, corrugated tube. And then you invert it, no problem. Okay, of course. Otherwise, I won't present it. So yeah, it shows good results. So it shows this type of corrugated tubes that has uh, 20 something percent higher buckling force and then 20 something percent lower inverting force than circular tubes. So that's what we want. So in this way, we can achieve more, a more reliable inversion. Uh, here are some experiments. I have three uh, corrugated tubes, one circular tubes. You can see you put them uh, into this machine and then compress it. You can see a circular tube doesn't work. This is simulation. Uh, corrugated tubes works great. And these are other corrugated tubes. They all work. They all work. Okay, these are the results. So, uh, short summary, how it works. So, okay, I just want to say uh, it's all about noticing the problem, right? When you ask, 
the right question. When you're noticing the right thing, that, that okay, well, what is wrong? I mean, something like that. And when you ask the right question, actually the answer is sometimes very obvious. So uh, here is the corresponding reference for this work. Okay, so the last one that I did for uh, in my PhD is crushing of thin wood beams and arches. So, okay, same story again. It's basically a starting by noticing the problem. So what can be improved was the, the, sh the shortage, right? That's, the, that's how we start a research. Uh, okay, so if we just take a normal thin wood beams, right, we bend it. And a, a very common phenomenon, uh, which is called a brazier's effect, I believe, so is that this cross section, the the height reduced a lot. So uh, you can see, like there's a huge drop of the cross section height, cross sectional height. So correspondingly, uh, it creates a very high stiffness at first because it has very high cross section, but low uh, low stiffness in, in later, right? Low strength. Let's say so you can see this job this is not what we want we said we want the energy absorption to be as flat as possible as high and as flat as possible right so is it possible that we can achieve a structure that has no cross no section height reduction in large deformation so basically we have a beam we bend it large in large deformation bend it by a lot that the cross sectional height doesn't reduce or doesn't reduce that much can we, can we can we have something right that's the question that's that's how we start this research okay the answer is yes and the design of origami beams and arches so okay hopefully this is not too hard to follow because these pictures are just very hard to understand i guess so let's think about a section right from the side of it side view of it and if we somehow can have this sort of zigzag shape Right, and then we uh, glue or let's say weld it uh, the two sides of it. They are non-deformable. And then when we bend it, right? Uh, if you think about it, the top surface, <coughs> sorry, is in compression, and then by this kind of trend, it's gonna be pushed up. And this bottom one is in tension. Well, it might not do much. Well. Just based on this, kind of intuitively, you can see that it, it should go up, right? The section height is going up. And if you um, connect them in sequence, then that looks like this. It's the side view of a beam. And then here's the forming process of that beam. This is a, starting from a flat sheet. You can stamp it, right? It's, uh, sequentially. And then the, it folds up into this. It's a beam. And then once these uh, parts, they touch each other, you uh, glue them or weld them. Well, uh, use like sort of sport welding or something, connect them. <clears throat> so here's the beam, it looks like this. And, and we compare this, uh, uh, our origami beams, or what we call it, and to these normal bumper beams. Same amount of material and then same type test. We put them into this uh, three point bending as you can see, huge uh, section height reduction observed here. And correspondingly, very large strength at first and then drops down afterwards, right? Not what we want. And here's our origami beam. Uh, let's just focus on the section height on these images. So this is straight and when we compress, you can see this, this part is bulging out. Compress further, bulging out more. You can see there's no section height uh, reduction. Right? The sectional height is increasing actually. You can see it's increasing, it's keep increasing. Yeah. So correspondingly the uh the reaction force you can see is quite stable. It's going up, going down, going up, going down, going up, going down, right? And compared to the previous one, it's flatter, it's closer to what we want. Also, this is the simulation, you can notice the uh bulging out of the top panels. So yeah, that's, it achieves what we want. And then if we compare them, these are the experimental reactions, uh, comparisons, you can see 
the red wines, the origami beans. Yeah, it, it reduces the peak force and then increases the later, how do you say, the later reaction force. So it's flatter. It's closer to what we want. It has um, 40 something percent increase of energy absorption. This is uh, energy absorbing efficiency. And also a 40 something percent decrease of kind of load uniformity, which means the load is flatter. Right? So in both ways, it's better. Of course, this design can be later developed into other kind of shapes, right? You can kind of uh, flip uh, size, well, a lot of tricks. I, I really enjoy doing this, like uh, a lot of creations. Oh, we can do this shape, that shape. Also uh, different, different types. They all work in the same way, a similar way. So here's a arch that you can see uh, it has some very weird shapes. You can do a lot by just playing uh, around with this type of geometries. They all preserve the uh, same phenomenon that uh, the maintaining of the cross-sectional height, right? Or in another way, say, a remove of the brazier's effect. Right? This is the corresponding uh, reference. Okay, so conclusion, well, we did this. I did this, like in my PhD. So it's just like summarized here. It's all about uh, ask the right question. And once you notice, oh, this is wrong. Actually, the solution are uh, very easy and cheap, right? Just do some geometric modifications. It brings in a significant, a dramatic improvement of performance. Yeah, so I think that's what I want to share for this. Okay, thank you.